All right, let's dive into the Word of God together. Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 10. We're going to be looking at verses 6 through 16. Father, thank you so much for this tremendous opportunity to speak your word to the hearts of your precious people. And God, I just pray that your spirit will come upon me, Lord, that your spirit will come. Come, Lord, and teach us. Teach us the truth of your word. Unclog our ears so we can hear what you have to say to us today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Acts chapter 10, looking at verses 6 through 16. And the title of this message is Religious But Lost. And this is part two of this message. Religious But Lost. Now, in part one of this study, we were introduced to a Roman soldier named Cornelius. He was very religious, but we saw that he was very lost. In other words, he did a lot of religious activities such as he feared God and gave to charity and he prayed to God always according to verse 2. However, an angel came to him and said in verse 4, your prayers and your charitable giving have come up for a memorial before God. Then he was instructed in verse 5 to send men to the city of Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. And now we pick up the conversation between the angel and Cornelius in verses 6 through 8. Look what it says there. It said that he is lodging with Simon a tanner whose house is by the sea, and he will tell you what you must do. And when the angel had spoke to him and had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. So when he had explained all these things to them, he sent them to Joppa. Now, in these verses, we see the angel is continuing to give Cornelius instructions. He told him to go to the city of Joppa and send for Peter in verse 5. Now he is given further details. He, he is now saying that Peter was lodging with Simon, who was a tanner whose house is by the sea. He will tell you what you must do. Now, there are three observations I want to bring to your attention from these verses. Number one, notice how the angel tells Cornelius to send men to Simon, a tanner whose house is by the sea. Now, I bring this up to encourage you to say that God knows where you live as well. Did you know that? He knows where you live. And did you know that God is behind where you're living right now? You said, no, no, this apartment complex had a special and I just <laughs> God is behind where you're living right now. Do you know why? He wants to reach those neighbors for Jesus Christ. Oh, it, it, it says it in Acts 17 in verses 26 and 27, for you note takers, it's not on the screen, that God has pre-appointed your times and your dwellings, that God wanted you to live where you're living right now, not to be a horrible neighbor, and a stuck-up neighbor, like some of you are, see your neighbor coming, you turn your head and go in the other direction. No. It said that so they can grope and find him, so they can find God through you living next to them or near them. God also knows who you are and, and, and knows you by name. He called Cornelius by his name in verse 3. He knew Simon by his name and even his occupation, that he was a tanner. And God knows you by your name as well, and he has put you on that job that you whine and complain about, <laughs> that you gripe about. God has placed you on that job. So he, you can reach those people for Jesus Christ. This is why you're on that job. So... He knows you by name, which means he hasn't forgotten you. Out of the seven billion plus people on this earth, he knows you by name. He called Abraham, 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 Saul, Saul, Samuel, Samuel, Mary, Mary, Simon, Simon. He knows you by name. Just, I know sometimes you feel like, has God forgotten me? 
He knows you by your name and knows where you live and knows where you work. God is not stalking you. <laughs> but he knows you. The second thing I want to bring to your attention is how the angel told Cornelius that Peter will come and tell you what you must do. This angel was more than capable of telling Cornelius about the gospel of Jesus Christ. But God, number two, uses people to carry out this awesome duty. Oh, I have to ask you, when was the last time you talked to people about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ? And that forgiveness is through the cross of Jesus I didn't say when was the last time you invited someone to church. That's good. It has its place. But the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. So don't argue with somebody about something religious and all of a sudden you say, yeah, I preached the gospel today. If it didn't have the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and forgiveness through the cross, then it wasn't the gospel. You had a religious conversation or maybe even a spiritual one. But it wasn't the gospel. When was the last time you talked to someone about the gospel of Jesus Christ? This is why when we repented of our sins, we were left here upon the earth to tell others about how God saved us. Oh, it's been rightfully put. We're just one beggar telling another beggar where we found bread. This is, this is why God... This is why God left us here. When we repented of our sin and accepted Christ into our hearts as our Lord and Savior, the reason why he just didn't rapture us up into heaven, because there's a reason for that. So we can tell others about how God saved us. You may be thinking, no, 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 Pastor Tony, we're, we're here to worship God. Well, we can worship God in heaven. No, no, Pastor Tony, no, we're, 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 we're here to learn about God. How much more are we going to learn about God in heaven? No, no, no. I got you, Pastor Tony. We're here to pray to God. We can pray to God in heaven. But the one thing we can't do in heaven is win lost people to Christ. We only have our time here on the earth to do this. So this is why the angel told Cornelius to go and get Peter. And he will tell you, what, notice, you must do. Salvation and eternal life through Jesus Christ is not an option. It's something we must do. If we want to have eternal life and spend eternity in heaven, we learn this from Acts 4.12, which says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. The word must there means of absolute necessity. It's not an option. It's not, well, you know, I, you know, I accept Christ. Eh, maybe, maybe not. It's not an option. I just think if I go to one more funeral and I hear every last person is thrown up into heaven, I think I'm going to scream. <laughs> Everybody's not going. It's not going. And there's a way to do it. You be graceful. That person may bust hell wide open this up, up here. But you don't go and tell that. You do at the funeral. Hey, you know your relative. They bust hell wide open. Soon, soon they close their eyes. Hell had a boom that took place. No, you don't do that. You don't do that. But, but see, I, as a matter of fact, I, just, I, I did one not that long ago. And I knew the person didn't know the Lord. I didn't talk about that. I said, you know what? I said, funerals is for the living. Not for the dead. Oh, you can come up and do, do whatever you do and quote unquote pay your last respects. But here's the thing, that person is gone. But the people are alive, that's who the funeral is for. And so it is something we must do if we want eternal life with Jesus Christ. The third thing I wanna to bring to your attention is this, can God count on you to take the gospel like he counted on Peter. He said, go get Peter, and he's going to come and tell you what you must do. Can the, Lord say, can the Lord say about you, go get, and put your name there, he's going to tell you what you must do. 
Some of you are saying, no, not me. Oh, don't, not me. Because I, I don't know what to say. What am I going to say? Right. Um, come to church and Pastor Tonya tell you? No. The Lord knew that he can count on Peter. This is why he said, go get Peter. He's, he's all the way in Joppa. But he's going to tell you what you must do. And I just wonder, can God count on you? Can God tap you on the shoulder and say, go across the hall and tell this person about me? Or guess what? Somebody's about to come during lunchtime and ask you some things about God. Can God count on you like he could count on Peter? The question is, did Cornelius obey the words of the angel? Well, verse 7 says, when the angel who spoke to him had departed, Cornelius called two of his household servants and a devout soldier from among those who waited on him continually. Notice how the soldier Cornelius sent with the two men were just like him. He was devout, which means showing or having deep religious feelings or commitment. Now, why did I bring this up? Watch this. This shows us that like begets like. We can only reproduce after our kind. Well, in Genesis chapter 1, for you note taker, it said that the living creatures brought forth after its kind. The birds brought forth after its kind. The beasts of the earth brought forth after its kind. Like begets like. If we are religious but lost, those around us will be the same way, religious but lost. Men, single parents, if we are a certain way, then our families will follow in our footsteps. In our footsteps. I know I got a friend that's an atheist. And guess what? His oldest daughter is an atheist. Like begets like. Look at where you are with your walk with God. Then your families will go no further than where you have gone. Like begets like. Cornelius in verse 2 is said to be devout. So the soldier he sent was also devout. In other words, we can only take people as far as we've gone. And this goes for everyone closest to us. So Cornelius explained everything the angel told him to the three men in verse 8. Look at verses 9 through 16 so we can get the context. It says, the next day as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And saw heaven open, and an object like a great sheet bound at four corners descended to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to Peter and said, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord. I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And the voice spoke to him again the second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. Incredible verses here. Incredible verses. In these verses, we see God preparing Peter for this historic moment of going into the house of a Roman soldier, something a good Jew will, would never do. And so on the next day, the three men traveled the 30 miles from Caesarea to the city of Joppa. And they knew exactly where to go as well from the specific instructions given by the angel. According to verse 9, as these men drew near to the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray at about the sixth hour, which is around noon. And seeing that the housetops in biblical times were flat, they were like a patio. They were also used as a quiet place to get away from the crowds and get away from the noise in the house. And they would go up there to meditate and go up there to pray and to get away and to get alone. 
And this is where vision is always given by God to us, away from the crowds, away from the noise, in a quiet place, with a quiet heart. Many people say, well, you know, I just don't know what God wants me to do. And I've said it many, many, many times. We have too much noise going on in our lives. All we got to do is just look, just look at, just look at the, this generation today. Every time you see them in the mall, walking down the street or whatever, they got some buds in their ears, some kind of headphones, some kind of, they just got to have something going on. They know nothing about the quiet. Nothing about how God speaks in a still, small voice. Because you got too much noise going on that you can't hear it. God is speaking. He's always speaking. We're not always listening. Because we got so much noise going on in our lives. Many of you want to hear from God and have him speak to you, but there's just too much noise. Too much noise. Headphones and music and TV and radio and just chatter and just background noise and just, I'm not looking at it, I'm not watching it, but it's just in the background and just, and, and, and many of you, I'm going to tell you now, you love the noise. You know why? Because, see, you have such a guilty conscience that if you will get quiet for a moment, the guilt of your sin will overwhelm you. And this is why you always got to have something going, some noise, some music, something. The most frightening thing for some of you is going to sleep at night. And many of you have now either go to sleep to, with the TV on or go to sleep with some music on because you don't want to get quiet with your conscience because it's eating you up about something you're doing or not doing. And this is why people are so, this is why people drink their sorrows away or smoke their sorrows away or drug their sorrows away because there is sorrow and guilt, and people are trying to get away from it. Vision begins in a quiet place, away from the noise as Peter did here. And so as Peter goes up on top of the roof to pray, verse 10 says that he became hungry. <laughs> I found this to be true as well. Whenever I purpose in my heart that I'm going to pray, Satan uses my body appetites to distract me. Uh, by either bombarding me with evil thoughts or s sleepiness or like we see here with Peter, hunger. However, God uses, God used, should I say, Peter's hunger to speak to him. So as the meal was delayed for some unknown reason uh, to Peter, he fell into a trance. Now, a trance, you think of a trance, some seance and just, you know, somebody just, no, no, no. The word trance is defined as that stage between sleep and awake. The Jewish philosopher Philo defined a trance as a divine intoxication where one is so full of God that he or she loses touch with their surroundings. This is the state that Peter was in, a divine intoxication. I, I love that definition by Philo. Now, how different are we today than Peter? As dinner was being prepared, Peter used this time to pray. We so often go watch TV, or we're definitely on our phones, scrolling through social media or Pinterest <laughs> as we're waiting on dinner to get done. Peter used this time to pray. Because prayer was a priority in Peter's life, something he learned by watching Jesus pray. If you ever want to know about the prayer life of Jesus, go through the Gospel of Luke. Luke seemed to emphasize the prayer life of Jesus. And if you will look, Jesus was always praying, always. I am aware that as a guest in the house of Simon the Tanner, uh, and, and, and Peter wouldn't be cooking, we know, 
So he was at the mercy of those cooking. He, he's probably wondering, what's taking y'all so long? You know, dinner's normally made by now. You guys are fooling around. He don't know why they were fooling around in the kitchen. But he used that time and took advantage of that time to go and pray. Now, so as he was praying, verse 11 says, and he saw heaven open and an object like a great sheet bound at four corners descended to him and let down to the earth. In this sheet uh, that descended upon Peter were filled with all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and the birds of the air, which happens to be how the animal kingdom is divided up in Genesis 6 and verse 20 as the, uh, um, the beast of the earth, creeping things and the birds of the air as how the animal kingdom is divided up. And Jesus spoke to Peter in verse 13 and says, rise, Peter, kill and eat. This, what I'm about to say is monumental. Because see, in Leviticus 11 and Leviticus 20, in verses 22 to 27, the Jews were given very specific instructions concerning what foods they could or could not eat. In Peter's vision, he sees clean and unclean animals, kosher and non-kosher foods all together upon a single sheet. Oh, I find this amazing because here is Peter who was hungry and God used food to speak to him. I thought that was amazing. I, I love this about the Lord, that he didn't come down on Peter for being hungry. He said, I, I led you to pray. Why are you doing stomach growling? What's wrong with you, Peter? No, he didn't come down on him. And because he was hungry, the Lord said, okay, I'm going to use food to speak to him. And it's amazing how Peter probably paid even more attention, seeing that he was hungry, that this vision had to do with food. He said, are you hungry, Peter? I will use food to speak to you. Did you know that God uses common everyday things to speak to us? So often you're looking for some supernatural, the sky to open up or some shooting star, some meteorite to hit your house. Or so I don't know what you're looking for. God uses common everyday things to speak to us. So what happened when Jesus said at the end of verse 13, rise, Peter, kill and eat. Peter responded in verse 14 and said, not so, Lord, for I've never eaten anything common or unclean. Peter seemed to have a problem with saying no to the Lord. In Matthew 16 and verse 22, when the Lord said he had to go to the cross, Peter, Peter again, not so, Lord, far be it from you, go to that cross. In John 13, in verse 8, when Jesus came around to wash the disciples' feet, he came to Peter, said, I've got to wash your feet. He said, no, 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 Lord, you ain't going to wash these dogs. You ain't seen feet like this before. And, and so he seen to have a problem with saying no to the Lord. I have to ask you, do you have a problem with saying no to God? Are you arguing with God over something he's clearly told you to do? And you're giving him every reason why you can't do it. And he's told you to do it. I don't know whether that's giving, whether it's tithing. I don't know what it is that God has told you to do. And you're giving every no reason why you can't. And saying, no, Lord, you're no different than Peter. There's been many times the Lord said, well, you know, why don't you go over there and talk to them about me? And I said, no, Lord. I'm ready to go home. Hang around. That, that conversation may take a long time. <laughs> I'm ready to get to the house. See, we, 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 we do that. We're, we're no different than Peter. So, Here's the thing. Peter is using a contradicting or a contradictory of terms in his answer to Jesus. He said, not so, and Lord. This is a contradictory of terms because if it is not so, then Jesus isn't our Lord. But if he is our Lord, then we cannot say not so to what he is asking us to do. So, it, if the Lord commands us to do something, then we cannot say to the Lord, not so. 
Oh, I know you're thinking about it right now. What the Lord has told you to do and you've said not so to him. Then he isn't your Lord. Because how can you say not so to your Lord? If he is your Lord, then we say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. It's not not so, Lord. But so often we find ourselves like Peter, don't we? Then the Lord responded in verse 15 a second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. Now, uh, please put your ears on what I'm about to say, because this is huge. This was monumental for God to speak this to Peter because he was saying two things. Don't miss this. Number one, this signified the abolishing of all of the Old Testament dietary laws. This is huge. Number two, the combination of the clean and unclean animals being seen together on one sheet was signifying that God was bringing together the Jews and the Gentiles into one body called the church, signified by the Jews being represented by the clean animals and the Gentiles being represented by the unclean animals. And the one thing, one of the main things that separated Jews and Gentiles was food. That wall, don't miss this, was coming down. And this is why God said in verse 15, uh, verse 15, what God has cleansed, you must not call common or unclean. Something the Jews constantly did. They constantly referred to the Gentiles as being unclean or common. Now, this was done three times, according to verse 16, and the object was taken up into heaven. This was done three times because Deuteronomy 17 and verse 6 and Deuteronomy 19 and verse 15 says, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. And Peter will recognize the three times as having great significance because he denied the Lord three times, according to John 18 and verse 17 and then verses 25 to 27. And because Jesus restored Peter three times or with a threefold application of truth. According to John 21 and verses 15 through 17. So he was very familiar with the number three. Oh, let me help some of you right here. This is where I'm really going to help some of you. This abolishing of the Old Testament dietary laws was huge for the Jews. Because this is one of the main things that distinguished them from the rest of the nations around. God wanted his people to be healthy physically to serve him effectively and certain foods were not good for them in order to maintain physical health. People today try to put us back under Old Testament dietary laws. Now, once again, they are good for us to be healthy if we follow them, but they will not make us holy. Healthier, yes, but not holier. Oh, you got to hear this verse here. I love this verse. 1 Corinthians 8, 8 says, But food does not commend us to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, nor if we do not eat are we the worse. What a great verse that is. The Greek word for commend, because I'm going to unpack this a little further. The Greek word for commend is peristemi, and it means to stand beside. So let's put it all together. In other words, Paul is saying that food doesn't make us stand beside God any closer if we don't eat certain foods, nor does it cause us to stand beside God further away if we eat certain foods. Healthier, yes, but not holier. Oh, the final set of verses that seals the deal for me on this subject is 1 Timothy 4, verses 3 through 5. Listen to what it says. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. Verse 4, ding, 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 ding. For every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused if it's received with thanksgiving. For it's sanctified or set apart by the word of God in prayer. So if I choose to enjoy my burgers and ribs 
and bacon. <laughs> or if I refuse these foods, it would not make any of us closer or further away from God. Healthier, yes, but not holier. Oh, somebody needed to hear that today. Somebody need to hear that because, see, you always going to have some folks that try to bring us back under those, those dietary laws. Now, here's the thing. If you follow them, you will be healthier. But don't think you'll be holier. Don't fool around and think you'll be holier. So if I choose to, to go and get me some ribs and some fries, you know, or if I go and get a, you know, a steak or something, or if I go and get a burger from somewhere, and you see me, don't trip. <laughs> don't try to bring me back under some bondage and all this kind of stuff and try to tell me, okay, what you can say, which is true, you can say, hey, that, that is not good for you. Right, I, okay, I get it. I get it. You know, we can justify anything. Well, you know, the, the, the beef is good protein. You know, I need that protein. You know, for building muscle. You know, I need the We can justify anything we want to. So don't let anybody put you under an Old Testament trip. You will be healthier if you follow them, not holier. Amen. Now, as Peter is no doubt scratching his head about this, you know, he's wondering what this, what all this meant, you know, and, and he woke up and he's like, whoa. He probably, first thing he probably said, they still, that dinner's still not ready? <laughs> so, so he's scratching his head about this. And at the same time, the men sent from Cornelius is about to approach the door. These two worlds are about to collide that we will see next time. Let me conclude with this. In this message, we saw how God knows your name and where you live. So this means that we can't hide from God. You can't hide from him. He knows where to find us. God has located you and brought you here today to hear this message. Now it's time for you to respond to God by repenting of your sins and surrendering your life to the Lord. We also saw that like begets like. Wherever you are right now, men, single parents, wherever you are in your walk with the Lord is only how far your family will be as well. So evaluate where you are in your relationship with God if you have one and just realize your family will go no further than you have gone yourself. Finally, that I must leave you with this. Food doesn't draw us closer to God or make us further away from him. Just keep in mind, food doesn't make us holier, just healthier. So stop putting a guilt trip on people if they choose to eat or stay away from certain foods. I've just thought about this. Romans uh, 14 talks about this. Makes it very clear. Said one man, one man think, you know, he can eat anything. Another man think that you can just be, eat only vegetables. Oh, vegetarian. Ah, what kind of trip have vegetarians have put on people? You eating that meat? Let me show you this video, what they do to that meat. Oh, stop. Stop. <laughs> stop. Stop it. Okay, yes, it will make us healthier, but not holy. Somebody need to hear that today. Somebody came just for that. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Now, now let me just say that don't think you can get out there and just fool around and go get and, and go get pick pick two uh, double uh, whoppers from 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 Burger King and you can just start scarfing down because it, you know it, you want to be healthy enough to do the work of the Lord. So don't fool around. And, and think you can just go and, and get a value meal every day and just think you're going to be on your back sick and you're wondering why you, you're sick and can't do the work of the Lord, can't serve and can't, because I'm sick again. you sick again. Yeah, I'm sick again. Well, change your diet. It, it will make you healthier, not Father, thank you so much for you, this, this word you have shared with us. Do a work in our hearts today. Lord, I pray for your people. I pray that you draw them to you. You brought them here. 
Lord, may they repent of their sin and draw closer to you. Lord, I just pray, move in our hearts. Lord, we, we always want to try to have one up on, on our brothers and sisters. Lord, please help us not to put guilt trips on each other about food. Oh, Lord, help us. Because even Jesus said it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man. It's what comes out. Oh, Lord, I just pray that you would just help us to watch what comes out. Because what comes out comes from the heart. So, Lord, we pray, move upon us by your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen.